Hey everybody, this is Carlos. Thanks for joining us. On today's show, we're going to be speaking with John Chosmer of John Chosmer Reptiles. John is a top boa breeder focusing on anery and VPI boa morphs. We're going to talk about how he got involved in the boa game and his plans for the upcoming season. We're also going to talk about his work with the sterling gene. Finally, we're going to talk about the importance of having patience as the hallmark of your breeding approach. Boa Rack Radio is on the air now. Welcome everybody to Boa Rack Radio. I'm your host, Carlos Rojas of Morphs Unleashed. And with me, I have my co-host today, Sergio Hernandez of Sergio Hernandez Reptiles. Serge, what's up, brother? Not much, man. Just uh, enjoying the evening, considering everything going on right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel you, man. Actually, uh, right before we uh, started doing the podcast, uh, I actually was trying to brush the teeth of my 200-pound Mastiff, and he was <laughs> not happy. He's got a little, little impacted tooth right now, so trying to get a 200-pound giant dog to comply is a little bit tough, even when they're well-trained, man. Yeah, that's but, not fun. Yeah, man. But uh, anyway, our guest today is uh, John Chosmer. Uh, John's based out of Ohio, and he's really well known for his work with Anery and VPIT Plus Morphs. John, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. So, John, for the people that are not um, familiar with you, give us a little bit of background of basically how you got involved with reptiles and then how eventually you got involved with boas. <clears throat> oh, well, uh, growing up in a uh, suburb area, my father was always a uh, nature freak. So we used to go down the, the creek all the time, checking out, you know, finding box turtles, black rat snakes, you know, water snakes, all that stuff. I was never allowed to own anything like that. My mother was uh, afraid of snakes. So it didn't, uh, uh, I wasn't allowed to have one until I was almost 13 years old. And that was, uh, I went to a friend's house and lo and behold, he had a, uh, a baby boa constrictor. And then after about a year of begging my mother to let me have one, you know, she let me finally get it. You know, I saved every penny I had as a kid to get it. And then, uh, but like with most parents, they think when kids see something like that, they go, ah, within a week or two, they won't bother anymore. Well, it went the opposite direction with me. Lifelong phase, huh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. So, so um, how did you start uh, getting involved with boas themselves? When, when was the first time you got a bow? And then kind of what eventually attracted you to focus on boas? Oh, I mean, like I said, I got my first bow between, uh, between 13 and 14 years old. You know, um, shortly after that, once I uh, did a little more research, because there was no internet back then, I had to do a lot of reading. Um, you know, I, I got a second one. I learned how to, uh, had a guy, a local breeder, show me how to sex them, which back then it was something I didn't want to do because I was afraid I'd hurt them. You know, again, being new to everything, I didn't know. Um, I, I grew my collection at the time as a kid slowly. You know, I had the, the pair of boas. I ended up getting a couple of corn snakes. Uh, I had a Burmese python. And uh, in all honesty, the first thing I ever bred, and it was totally an accident, was the Burmese python. That was the first thing I ever produced. And uh, hatching the eggs was kind of cool, but then once I read up a little more, figured out a little more about the boa constrictors, and my first one gave live birth, to me that was just the coolest thing ever, seeing the babies come out in the boa goo that was so much more interesting than a pile of eggs. Now that's awesome, man. And then uh, how old were you uh, the first time uh, that that Burmese was, uh, gave birth or dropped that uh, clutch of eggs for you? Uh, my Burmese first one probably uh, I was probably about eighteen. Oh wow, seventeen, okay. eighteen. And then how about so, with the boa? I mean, uh, twenty-two. Oh man. Okay, so yeah, you've been doing this for pretty much the majority of your adult life, then, if not all of it, right? Pretty much. Yeah, I'm very. I'm forty-five now, so yeah, a little over almost thirty years. That's <laughs> that's awesome, man. So let's talk outside. What what outside of uh, reptiles actually catches your interest? What are some of your hobbies and the things that you do outside of uh, you know your reptile collection? Uh, outside, outside the reptiles. I mean, I enjoy world travel. Um, I mean, my main focus for traveling is obviously. I mean, I like Central and South America just so I can do a lot of herping. Um, I've been to Costa Rica, uh, Colombia, Peru, Peru, Ecuador, um, areas like that. You know, obviously just going down there. I mean, my thing is I enjoy seeing the animals in their natural habitat more than it is behind. You know, seeing stuff like at a zoo or whatever. It's just more interesting to see it that way. Um, I just recently took up scuba diving. Oh, nice, so man. I've been, I've been, 
yeah, I've been doing that. I just got my wife involved in that. She got her certification last year. So uh, we're gonna. I mean, being in Ohio, there's not a whole lot of places to scuba dive unless you go to right. Rock Quarry. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, I took her to Florida last year to get her certification. So I figure we'll do a couple of rock quarries up here, and then you know, once or twice a year, we'll try and go somewhere a little more uh, uh, ocean side. That's awesome, man. So let's talk a little bit about some of that field herping. That's uh, pretty interesting because I think a lot of people that keep boas have always wanted to see them in their natural setting, right? And I know I'm a big field herper. I actually grew up in Ecuador. Uh, but a lot of people out there, you know, it's it's essentially like a pipe dream that they've always had, right? Um, so kind of talk a little bit about maybe some of your experiences seeing boas in their actual natural habitat. Uh, well, I mean, I've been, I went to Costa Rica for – I've been there three or four times before I ever seen a boa constrictor in the wild. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Before I ever seen a live boa constrictor in the wild. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, there's quite. I mean, you know, and where we were, where where we stayed at, you know, it, back then the, it didn't have paved roads. All the roads were dirt, but they were heavily traveled. And a lot of the locals down there don't like snakes in general anyway. So if they see one, they normally kill it. So I mean, I've seen a lot of roadkill and stuff where uh, when you were uh, herping in the, in the uh, jungle itself, people if they see them, they if they're cutting trails, they'd obviously kill them, you know, because they didn't know the difference between a boa constrictor or a fur lance. Right. So, but I mean, I, I finally saw my first live boa constrictor in Costa Rica uh, two years ago, and then um, but I saw my first Peruvian in Peru three years ago, and that just blew my mind seeing the Peruvians. It was just amazing to see. I mean, they're so much more beautiful in the wild. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's something that a lot of people can't can't really appreciate until they've had the chances to see a wild one. I know myself. I've seen uh, a couple of wild uh, Ecuadorian black boas in the wild, and those things are pretty amazing, man. There's just a level of iridescence that I think sometimes might even be lost, uh, you know, within captive collections, right? So, let's uh, go back to talking a little bit about reptiles. So, tell me about what made you go from a hobby collection into a breeding collection. Ah. Uh. Primarily, it was probably a limited space and funds. I mean, you figure when I first started, you know, I mean, by the time I got my first place, my house, I didn't actually have an, an, enough area to have a bunch of animals. I ended up converting my one-car garage into a, a snake room. Um, I mean, back then, I was, for the, for the majority of my time, I was a single father, so all my all my extra money went to my kids. You know, only only one of us could uh, have the designer clothes, or is it the designer clothes or designer snakes, and the kids overruled that quickly. So... But uh, once I mean, once my kids grew up and uh, I met my wife now, we decided we wanted to move out to the country. So me and my wife bought a small farm, and it had uh, two two built two pole barns on the build, on the property. So I was able to convert my uh, what was before a uh, maybe a hundred square foot room into now was uh, probably about a thousand square foot room. So that's obviously it's a limited space. And now that I've got the space, I'm trying to build more and. Uh, my idea now is to try and actually build a second building to produce to even have even more. Oh, that's awesome, man! And I, and I, and I know getting out of uh, you know potentially your home and actually expanding that into a, an additional building is something that's you know something that a lot of people look forward to, and, and it provides you some advantages. But maybe talk about a couple of the challenges. I know, Sergio, you're kind of in the same boat too, right? Where you have a separate building. Yeah, I was wondering, like, when when you moved into that first room. Where you're like, oh, this is perfect, enough room, and then you outgrow it, and now you're going into the second one. Or what do you think when you first got into it? Oh, I mean, like I said, when I first when I left my excuse me, when me when we first moved out here to the country, you know, I went from like a hundred square foot room, and then I built a room in my basement that was maybe three hundred square foot. And my my dream was, I mean, you know, when you first get in this, you you dream big, dream big. So like, I want to go bigger. Well, then I, I built the bigger room in my barn or pole barn. You know, it's heated. Everything where it needs to, work, it needs to be for temperature control. And I went from 300 square feet to just under 1,000 square feet. And my wife, when I got done building it and moving stuff in there, she was like, oh, that should last you forever. I think it took me <laughs> six months. <laughs> I, th I think it took me six months to fill that room because I think, you know, three. I, I got that room done three years ago. And yeah. I think I kept back just about everything I produced to fill that room. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Oh, man. So um, when you were also kind of going from, uh, you know, a hobby collection more to a breeding collection, were there anybody that kind of mentored you in that process or any, any people that you looked towards for inspiration within the BOA game? 
Uh, I'd probably say, you know, in the bow game, it was probably the Barkers, mostly Tracy Barker. Because um, when, 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 when I met my wife, you know, when the snakes were not her thing originally. And they're still not, still not, but she enjoys them with me more than anything. But, uh, I mean, I would contact Tracy Barker, trying to um, find out the newest things out there. Because like, the Internet was just becoming new back then. I mean, it wasn't a huge thing. So not all the websites and things was available like everybody has today. But uh, I'll never forget, and I think it was two. 2007, I contacted Tracy Barker, and uh, this is back when the uh, VPI stuff was getting starting to come out there pretty good. And uh, I bought a pair of uh, a pair of double hit and one triple hit for VPI snow bows off of her. And when I bought those, to me at the time, that was probably one of the biggest investments I ever made. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, I, I dropped a, I dropped a good amount of money on three snakes that I never even asked for pictures of. So I just trusted Tracy's judgment that she was going to send me three quality animals, which she did. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely. beautiful animals. I still have one of them today, you know. But, uh, I mean, that was probably, back then it was pretty scary for me. Cause like I said, I, mean, I wasn't making a lot of money and everything. I still live in, you know, in my old house. And, um, but, uh, yes, I mean, that, I mean, <clears throat> with the bows, I said she was the biggest help to me. You know, she was always answer all my emails, answer all my phone calls, answer all my questions. But uh, I mean, being in Ohio, you know, Ohio was the, uh, the first reptile shows ever were in Ohio, and they were run by right. the Hampers yeah. up in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, when I started going to those shows when I was younger, you know, I I, I don't want to say I was good friends with the Hampers and the Circles back then, you know, because obviously I was just new to everything and new to the show. But, uh, you know, the Zirkles and the Hampers talk to me a lot. And uh, to this day, I'm, I'm good friends with, with all of them. I mean, Dom's recently passed away, but right. you know, I still talk, to, still, talk, still talk to Shay and, you know, and uh, Rob and Amy Zirkel quite a bit. So That's awesome. They're probably, they're probably the biggest ones that I talk to. So let's talk about, thing. yeah, man. So let's talk about your current uh, project focuses. Tell me some of the stuff that you're currently working with and things that got you excited. Ah, uh, the, v- the VPI was probably back then one of my biggest things. It still is one of my biggest things. I still love the VPI gene, but I mean, I'm huge on the Andrew gene. I love the Andrew gene, and just for the fact that what it can do. Um, I mean, you, you figure. I mean, everybody likes the you know the, the brighter colored animals, which I mean, who doesn't? They, they're an eye catcher. Every time you go to a show, you know they want the bright colored thing. But I mean, in all honesty, the Andrew gene will draw you towards. You know, that's what going to help produce your snows and your VPI snows. But, uh, so, I mean, so, yeah, I do, I do a lot with the Andrew gene, the VPI gene. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing that into other, you know, um, dominant genes, the, uh, the ING as well. So, I mean, I'm trying to focus on all those and combine them together. One of the things that I wanted to kind of bring up, man, is uh, the Snow Lab project that you're currently working on. Maybe talk a little bit about that. All right. Yeah, I produced my first VPI snows three or four years ago um, from, the, from the ones I got from Dave and Tracy Barker. Um, what's funny about that is I raised those boas up, the ones I got from Tracy, and at the time, you know, the VPI snow had not even been you know, created yet. Nobody even knew what it was going to look like. Um, but I mean, I, I, the ones I got from her, I believe, were, you know, sub-adult yearlings. Um, I raised them up, and I bet it took me another four years, five years before I even got any babies out of them. The females just, for some reason, would not even take. So, right. but once I finally, once I finally got them, it was just like, holy cow, I finally produced them. But uh, I think it was Kyle Frost that produced the first ones. If memory serves me right. But, yeah. But yeah, I, I got those, and then since then, you know, I've been. It's just you know, obviously, once you produce it, you're like, what kind of what else can I put into this? Because the the first VPI snow glow that I produced, you know, it comes out this purple hue. And, I mean, purple is by far my favorite color. So I'm, I'm like, what else can I do to this? What else can I enhance this, you know, to make it look better? And um, I'm trying to base that. So now I'm trying, you know, I just recently uh, got some labby stuff off of Jeff Ronnie. So, and what I didn't know is when I got the labby, my second labby off of him, the labby was, was 100% HEP VPI. Oh, which, nice, man. So, and, and after I got it, you know, I seen some talk on Facebook People were talking about this and that, and I cannot remember who else got something from that litter, but I mentioned I, I showed a picture of the one I had, and they're like, hey, is that one head angry or possible head angry? And I'm like, I don't know. i got to ask Jeff. 
So when I'm, I contacted Jeff, and Jeff's like, oh, yeah, that one's 50% ahead of Andrew. And I'm like, oh, my God, that makes us even better. Oh, man. So, dude. What a so, score, dude. Right? What a score. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I mean, he's a beautiful animal. He's still young. He's only like 18, 19 months old. So, I mean, obviously, I, I've gotten males to breed young, and I, and I want him I want him to go because I've got an adult visual VPI snow female right now, and he wants nothing to do with her. And I'm like, yeah. oh, man. So I, so I think this, that project is going to go into next year, which is fine. Um, I don't know. And I mean, I talked to Jeff decently amount, but I don't know if he has any, if he's going to be able to produce any visuals this year or not. I don't know who else out there is trying for it, but I know I sure. I, well, I believe Tony uh, Antonucci's trying for it. Yeah, Maybe I think Tony's can, trying. Yeah, in the same yeah. litter as mine, so they be possible. Yes, so, yes, so his are possible Henry as well. Yeah, man, I think I think he's definitely trying for it. Serge, is that some you're 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 uh, knocking on that door of that too? Uh, not quite. The the only thing I could probably shoot for next year would be um, Aztec, Labby, Fire, VPIs, but yeah, no big deal. Henry. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, with the with the Labby Snow stuff, I I'd be behind on that one. Yeah, I want to see him though. I want someone to make them or something I could pick up maybe. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What? man. I just want to see those things pop out. It'd be, it'd be super nice to buy one of those. Shoot. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I actually, I actually have a um, a hypo Labby right now. Actually, my first Labby I got from Jeff Ronnie. Um, it's a hypo Labby female. And I bred to a visual VPI snow male, and she's grabbing right now. Woo! Oh, nice. So, so if perfect. anything, if anything, I'm going to get 100% hits and not a possible hit. What's the possible hit? I hope proves out. But either way, this way I've got my 100% hits for down the road. Yeah, no, man. That sounds yeah, like a killer pairing. Awesome. Yeah. So, brother. Yeah, what a, a nice surprise on the other one if it proves out. It's uh, nice oh. to find out after the fact, oh, it's 50%. Hey, there's a chance. <laughs> Always taking a chance. It's always a gamble. Yep. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. So I know you uh, you're working with some hypo Aztec jungle snows right now. I'm trying to hit that. Talk a little bit about that project and maybe what, what you're trying to do to to make that a reality. Yeah, I, um, I'm working on. Uh, I want to obviously the uh, the T positive snow. You know, because the you know being the caramel albino and the Anri combined is a huge thing for me. Um, another another one, probably one of my second most anticipated litters this year besides the Labby. Is I have a let me make sure I got this right. It's a ghost. It's an IMG ghost jungle female that I bred to an Aztec VPI male. So this way I'm hoping to get the hypo Aztec jungles IMGs 100% head VPI snow. Oof, man, it's gonna be a smoking That'd be awesome. litter. Yep, that'll be a smoking litter. Any other IMG stuff that you're uh, hoping to hit on this year? Ah, uh, I'm working on uh, I'm working on IMG sharp stuff as well. I don't have a lot of sharp stuff in my collection, but I am working on one or two liters of that. Um, trying to think what else I have here. I've got another another ghost jungle IMG possible head albino call albino female that is currently granted by a albino motley 100% head and ray male. So. Hopefully that one there will prove out. You know everything will prove out. Hit on hit something good on that one as well. Yeah, man, that'd be awesome, dude. And then uh, yeah. in a little bit we're gonna talk about uh, a recent boa litter that that yeah, just the, the dropped here. And um, but um, right now let's kind of go back and talk a little bit about anneries because I think anneries tend to be probably one of the most underrated genes that are out there, right? And you know as you said everybody's super excited by uh, the bright colors, but really it's the anery gene that makes some of the crazier combos possible. So tell me what kind of drew you to anery boas in the first place. Ah, well, I mean, in my opinion, though, obviously, I mean, the, the first morph I ever bought a uh, boa constrictor visual was an albino boa, and for the, I couldn't tell you what, what year it was I bought that in, but I was super excited to have it, and everything I ever seen was baby albinos. I'd never seen an adult. So I bought this baby albino boa, it was beautiful. I loved it. I raised it up, and I'm not knocking albinos in any way because I got a whole collection of them. But they yellow out. They turn out to be this yellow banana with no hardly any pattern, if at all. Um, Absolutely. Some of them, don't get me wrong, some still have great color in the tail. Some still have great saddles, but not all of them do. A lot of them yellow out. The Anri 
interesting. You know, I mean, it's just one of those things where it's already dark, and as it matures, it still looks just as good, if not better, as an adult. The pattern, you know, the pattern's not going to change. The color's not going to change. And, you know, you're getting what you get now as an adult. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. And and I think there's one of the things that I will give a lot of credit to uh, guys, especially in the ball python industry about, is the fact that with a lot of uh, the anery genes that they have there, or azanthic as they like to call it, you know, um, they really are have been working those projects real, real hard into a lot of different avenues, producing animals that are, you know, standalone beautiful just based on that anery gene, right? So tell me a little bit about some of the pr projects uh, within the anery gene that you're currently working with. Oh, I've got so many. I mean, I, I try, I'm, I'm trying to pump anery into everything I have, actually. I mean, I said the anery to me is a key ingredient uh, to a lot of different things. I mean, for those out there who – everybody enjoys the snows. Everybody – Enjoys the moon glows, you know, it's the white snake with the pattern. You can't have that without the anery, obviously, even pulling out pulling out the uh, the red the red gene and everything. But I mean, like right now I've got some uh, sub adult uh, anery uh, anery motley Aztecs that are just phenomenal. Um, yeah, I've got anery anery ghost jungles. I got um, the anery motleys. Like, and I said, well, I mean, even the, the motley gene in itself is a dark gene. You know, it makes everything appear dark. Right. But you add the add the anery to it, and it's just black. And you know, and like I said, the, as a, they scream as an adult, they're just an incredible color, you know. And uh, I mean, the anery Aztecs, which I don't have any plain Aztec anries, but I've got the motley Aztecs, which you know, I mean, I hit I hit on that. I'm happy to have it, but I don't have any plain anery Aztecs yet. But uh, I mean, who knows? I might spit some out this year. Yeah. No, man. That, that's going to be pretty awesome when you do. So what do you think this gene is still underrated? Why do I think it's still underrated? There's so much to be done with it. I mean, can you wait till, wait till the Anery Labby comes out. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, I know, um, what is it? I think I think Ken, Ken, um, I'm a butcher's last name, Baumgartner. Yeah, Baumgartner. Uh, I mean, he, I, yeah, I, think, I think he just produced a litter of uh, Labbies and Hypo Labbies that are all head call. I mean, so I mean, obviously, you know, everybody wants the, the bright snake. I understand it. I love it. Right. You know, they're beautiful as babies. They fade as adults. But I mean, for those of us who who are doing this as a business, you know, I mean, we're in a business to sell babies, not adults. It's, you know, obviously, the babies look better. But I mean, I can. I mean, I'm obviously with my uh, hypolabia I got gravid right now. Everything's going to be you know hit VPI snow. But I mean, I obviously with some of the babies I'm going to hold back and try and produce the Anri Anri Labby itself. I believe Jeff's going to beat me to that, but I'm, I'm still in the race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. And, and honestly, I think you, you said it correctly, dude. Um, not that much has been done with it, you know? And then now imagine when we are able to start plugging in things, for example, like Pied into Anery. And we start oh, making like, like the Panda Pied Boa. You know what I mean? Something to that equivalence. I mean, it's I going mean, to be insane. I mean, I mean look, at the, look, at the, yeah, look at the lightning Pied Ball Python. I mean, that thing is amazing. You know, I mean, like I said, the black and white contrast on that, and then you take the pie, the pie boa now and add the anery, anery to that. It's gonna, be, I think it's gonna be incredible. incredible. Yeah. Incredible. No, absolutely, man. And I and I've been working a little bit with anery too. Right now, I'm focusing on a lesser known line of anery called the Silver Bullet line, um, just okay. because I like the thicker saddles. But dude, I'm with you, man. I think anery has a lot of potential, and I think a lot of people are still sleeping on it right now. You know. Yeah. I agree. I, mean, I, was, I was one of the ones that was sleeping on it to like the past year and a half. I, I used to pick up stuff that was double head or head anery, but not really on the visual stuff. And the past year and a half, I started doing that. So, yeah, John's right. It, it's it's underrated, and a lot of nice stuff is coming out of it. Yeah. You know, honestly, who, who really turned me into the anery gene uh, is actually Brad Sherman. And uh, – he he works a lot with uh, Chaz down in the va in the Phoenix Valley area, and um, they have both been mm -hmm. working Anery a lot into their collect into both of their collections, man. And you know, just seeing, you know, over the past three four years that I've known the, that I've been hanging out with those guys down there, you know, seeing some of the stuff that they produce, especially with like the black eyed Anery stuff that's being mixed in there. Oof, so much potential, man. So much potential with dark boas. I think everybody right now has really get, really got excited about IMG. But to them, it's like IMG or nothing. Really, IMG, I think, is a great ingredient within Anery. But obviously, Anery itself is a super powerful ingredient that really needs to be explored even further. Yeah. I mean, from one of, one of my experiences, I mean, <clears throat> I produced some really black Anery's. 
and I've also produced some of the anneries. They have the more of the uh, charcoal light gray color in them as well. And all the anneries that I've ever used, I mean, a lot of mine are all, all head albino as well. But the only ones that I've used in the, the head albino with are the ones that I'm trying to make snows with. Right. And the ones that I've noticed that are the, the blacker anery produce the whiter snows. And so yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people, snow, there's, yeah, the snows grow up and the snows tend to yellow out. But I've noticed that yeah. when I'm using the blacker anery, they stay whiter longer. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that one. And I think that's something that people need to consider when they're going out there and selecting, you know, who to buy anneries from, you know? So for the people listening out there, if you guys want a darker anery, hit John up because obviously, like, he's been focusing on really creating that. So um, Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, John, because I was actually going to ask you, in your opinion, what was it that causes, like, the yellowing in snows? So I'm glad you mentioned that about the anneries. It's a... Uh, kind of great you've noticed that so john yeah, man, I, I, I produced the black the blacker ones and the lighter ones so the blacker ones definitely produce the better some better snows yeah yeah no i'm with you guys nice so john let me ask you something um whoop, there we go is that your bird <laughs> all right yeah that's funny. he's out there talking and doing the smoke detector <laughs> that's awesome Hey, man, so um, let me ask you something. Give me some important lessons that you learned when you started setting up your reptile business. Buying quality animals. I mean, don't buy cheap. And, I mean, everybody thinks when you're buying quality and they think, they think buying quality, you have to go to a, a big, reputable breeder. And in the long run, if you think about it, we were all small at one time. I mean, it, it takes a while to become a yeah. bigger, well-known breeder out there. But my thing is, the people out there, I, I tell people all the time, you want to buy quality, buy what you can afford, don't buy it just to have it. But then, I mean, it's okay to buy from somebody else who's just starting out in this business, you know, because obviously they, got, they want to get bigger sooner or later anyway. But when you're buying the animal from them, make sure they're going to be around for you in three months, six months, nine months to ask your, answer your questions. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, we all know there's flippers in the business who, you know, buy stuff to resell it and make a dollar. But, you know, you want that person that, you know, you, hey, I'm buying this. I'm going to I'm gonna take it. I'm going to breed it. You know, future on that line, if I got questions, will that breeder be there to answer my questions for me? So, I mean, if you buy, I mean, let's just say, you know, there's an animal out there for $500, but this other guy has it for 200 I mean, will he answer your question for you in six months when you have it? Yeah, essentially, you're paying for the customer service and the feature and the support, right? And exactly. one of the, thing, one exactly. of the things like I think me and Sergio have talked about in the past is that really what you're doing there, you're not only investing in the animal, you're investing in a future business relationship. Because the reality is the guys that produce the nicer stuff usually tend to be the guys that buy the nicer stuff also, right? So. Correct. If you do it right, you're essentially setting up the baseline for a good business partnership that can last many years and eventually turn into a friendship like it has for, you know, almost all of us within the hobby. So, brother, in your eyes, what do you see as the future of the hobby? Oh, man, the future is so open. I mean, there's so much to be done. Uh, like I said, there's so much to be done. So much has been untapped. I mean... I mean, there's so many new genes coming out. I mean, I mean, just, like I said, we brought up the pied earlier. I mean, uh, just imagine what you add, what you add that pied to. I mean, once you uh, add, you know, obviously I want I want to pump the anthracitic into that. But I mean, can you imagine trying to pump, you know, a motley pattern into that or an Aztec pattern into that? I mean, I mean, I've only seen a couple, you know, the, the few pictures of the pies that are out there. You've yet to see one in person, which I'm dying to ha dying to have one in my collection. But I mean, just to try and add different pattern and color to that. I don't want to see it as an albino. That's just my personal opinion. You know, I think it'll fade a little bit. But uh, the, you know, pump pattern and pump color into that. There's 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 so much to be done in this business, this hobby. So much. Yeah, absolutely, man. How about you, Sergio? What's your take on kind of some of the future of the hobby? Oof, I, I guess it's up to anyone's imagination. Cause just because we all like different projects. But uh, like me personally, obviously, it's like the VPI, VPI snow stuff. A lot with Labby. I'd love to see the pied stuff, obviously. And the good thing is the pied is so new that it's got so much to be worked with. So we'll be seeing that one for like the next maybe 15 years, putting quality into it. But uh, I think it's up to a person and, and their imagination, whatever they think they can create and they want to see. Um, everybody's takes a little different. So it's kind of hard to just say one thing, but that's, yeah. that's what I think. 
Yeah, man. I know personally for me, I'd like to see the resurgence of maybe some of the genes that were worked on early in the hobby that maybe have faded away. Like, for example, like whatever happened to for to like the Russian tea positive. Do you guys remember that one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that, there, like, there were quite a couple of tea pods, Russian. And I was just thinking about that the other day, but I think there were like two or three that just kind of faded away. Yeah, and I think they faded away because I think what had happened with a lot of those projects is they were bought by people who wanted to have a quick turnaround financially, right? And maybe weren't in the hobby for the right reasons. Yeah. And, you know, they were, they, they, a lot of them, I know a couple that actually uh, invested into those projects, man. And they were definitely the type of people that dropped money on it real quick and they didn't see a profit within like two years because obviously boas are a little bit of a heartbreaker at times, right? And then they literally sold off their animals on Craigslist, man. You know what I mean? So, like, you, yeah. it, it's one of those things that I think we're going to end up seeing a lot of these uh, older genes resurface in the future and maybe start hitting on new combos that we've forgotten about. And the only reason that I think that that's going to happen is because we've seen that before. Um, you know, we always bring up the ball python hobby in that sense because the ball python hobby, um, because it's easier to breed balls okay um they're able to progress that specific uh animal a little bit faster than for example the boa in the boa world right so therefore they've been able to you know get the resurgence of certain genes like for example um i know john before uh, we started recording we started talking a little bit about ball pythons but like look at the price of spot noses right Look at the price of tri stripes and those type of morphs within ball pythons. A couple of years ago, you could get them for dirt cheap, and now all of a sudden, the prices have you know double, tripled, quadrupled on some of those. So I think it. I think these are the situations that are still yeah, well, once they can happen. Well, I think I think that comes down to what I said. Like you said, the, the base price of those jeans in the beginning are very high, and then nothing's really done with them, and they drop down. But then when people find out, they can add it to once somebody else goes. I wonder what this does. You know, they added to something else, and then it's like, holy crap! This has just made something miraculous. I mean, from I mean, I mean, everybody's put, pumping now. I mean, again, the ball python thing, pumping the spot nose into the clown, and it's just doing amazing things. But by itself, it was not that great. You know. Right. Right. Well, guys, we're going to take a quick break right now, and then uh, when we come back, I want to talk with you, John, about the importance of having patience in this hobby. All right, guys, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about a subject that uh, we've touched on in the past, but really we want to focus on it because we have a lot of new listeners and a lot of listeners that are, you know, coming over from other species like ball pythons really wanting to focus on boas. And that's the topic of patience. Um, When people set out to invest in boas, you know, they often dream about this huge financial reward that can be associated with a high demand litter. Obviously, boas have tend to have more babies per litter than, you know, a lot of other species. Um, but unfortunately, uh, at best, they're unpredictable, actually. At worst, they're heartbreaking. And this is one of the biggest issues with people that are coming over. They, they expect this quick turnaround. But in reality, uh, boas are definitely a species that requires a lot of patience. So let me ask you guys something. Um, why do you guys think having patience and setting realistic expectations is so important? I'll go first. Yeah. I mean, you figure, like I said, the whole patience thing, and, you know, bow is obviously going to take, you know, people can breed ball pythons in two years. Bows, you're looking at three to five years to breed a female, minimum. I mean, granted, you can probably breed them younger, but it's not healthy for them. Right. Um, I mean, plus, with, you know, with, 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 as heavy, with as heavy as people are feeding the ball pythons, I mean, just pythons in general, people were power feeding and power feeding. If you power feed a boa like that, you're going you're gonna to shorten his lifespan in half just by feeding it heavy. And then if you try and breed it too young, you know, you can shorten his lifespan as well. So, I mean, it's better, like, like we said, the whole patience thing. Take your, take your three to five years, grow your female slowly, get her to size. I mean, you don't want her, if they don't have that square box look to them, you know, if they're flat or, you know, saggy or wrinkles in the tail, you got an overweight snake. Right. And that's just not healthy for them. I mean, the, fe- the female in general, when she looks like that, you know, she's either going to produce a small litter, premature, I mean, 
that's the bad thing about. Yeah, and and have you noticed that with a lot of younger females, they tend to slug out a little bit, a little bit, or a little bit more, or basically, what's some of the things that you've noticed when people have tried you, to breed snakes too young? I mean, uh, I've never tried to breed a female under three years myself personally. Yeah. Um, and the, I mean, three years is the youngest I've ever bred a female. I mean, most of my females I try to breed at three to four years, and again, that a lot, a lot of that depends on their size as well. Right. I mean, I've had females at three years old that are not quite the size, so I won't breed them. But is I mean, there a specific the weight criteria that size, you have for them? Like roughly, uh, I, I know, I know. Obviously, we're looking for for a square body, right? I mean, like that's the number one criteria: good muscle, good muscle tone, and everything else. But is there like kind of an average weight that you would think um, most of your uh, females need to kind of reach before you? You consider pairing a male to them? I like my minimum to be eight pounds. Okay. How about you, sir? Eight, pound, eight pounds is where I like to be minimum. To be, it'd probably be. To be honest, I've never weighed them. I just go. I, I look at them by by judging by looking at them. They're typically minimum like five and a half feet, and I, I'm guessing they're probably going to be around ten pounds or so. But yeah, same same guidelines as John. And to add what what he mentioned earlier, um, as far as patience, like for new people coming into it, I think what happens is if they set expectations where they want to breed early and stuff like that and they're not patient, they just automatically set themselves up for failure. Um, They're the ones that kind of burn out. I don't know what's going on. They won't breed. They die. Things happen. They slug out. And then they end up getting out of the hobby. Um, Patience is definitely key for anybody. At least with boas. I've never done the ball pythons, and I know it's a little different. So, just different takes on it. Yeah, no, and, and I think, you know, uh, John, you also mess with ball pythons from time to time. I mean, like with ball pythons, you could get a female breeding in two years, you know? that is Is that fair to say? It's very fair. Yeah. Easily. Yeah, so I think... I, I, mean, think I, I, I honestly know people who... Have, who no, I was going to say, I know people who have pumped females up so fast that they, they had them breeder ready in 18 months. And wow. to me, that's just, I mean, trying try to get a, try to get a boa male to breed at 18 months is incredible, let alone getting a female to breed at 18 months. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The, one, the one good thing with the boa males is the fact that, you know, they, they'll tell you right off the bat if they're even interested in even attempting it, right? How many times have you brought up a, a younger male and it's their first season, whether it's 18 months or three years, you throw them in that cage, and all that dude does was – sit under the water bowl or sit on the opposite side of the cage or you know just completely avoid <laughs> your female so yeah i'm with you guys on multiple that. times yeah yeah so um let me ask you something how does a lack of patience kind of set up a breeder for failure like what do you think that kind of does mentality wise and why should we kind of avoid that well, I think mean, I think a lot of it's got to do with if you try and rush anything. I mean, but when I mean you put, you can put it in aspect for anything in life in general, not even just boa breed. If you try to rush to get a job done or to get a boa breeder size, you know, like you said, you're you're setting yourself up for failure because you're, you're you're there's a chance you're harming the female, you're harming the male. Um, you know, the females cannot be ready, even if they are ready. You know, you, you shorten her lifespan by the overfeeding, breeding too young, and then. You uh, let's just say you did wait the three to four years, and your female finally does breed. You know, like we said, that's the difference between a, a live bearer and an egg layer. If the egg layer lays lays you six eggs, you know the females drop the eggs. Now everything's on you and your incubator. If right. one or two eggs go bad, you you still got four good eggs. If you're female, you know, I mean, I've had females, and I hate to say it, but I've had females that will ovulate. I'm talking about talking boas now. Females will ovulate, and then they'll have their post ovulation shit, and then just out of the blue, they they die, and it's like, what happened? You know, yeah, no. Just, I've I've spent five years raising this girl up, and I don't know what happened. And if you can't take the heartache of that, boas are not for you. Yeah, no, and I'm with you. Actually, I had that happen last year. I had uh, this beautiful, beautiful, big, big uh, f- uh, female uh, visual VPI. That was had snow that I got from a breeder on the East Coast. Raised her up for a couple of years. I got her as a sub adult uh, when that when this person was getting out of uh, out of the hobby. Anyway, brought her in. You know, she was a large female man. She was one of those rare females that were you know legitimately touching ten feet, right? And uh, she had never been bred prior to me uh, getting her. I basically got her when she was about six and a half foot. Got her to 
about that 10 foot mark took my time with her i tried pairing her a couple times she never took finally i get and i and img had snow uh to go at her and to breed her everything's looking fantastic i see this massive ovulation i'm like oh my god this thing's gonna drop 50 babies on me you know what i mean i was so excited and then about a week and a half before she was due to drop the litter okay i went in and i found her dead dude it was freaking heartbreaking yeah. um so i ended up um because you know i'm a science nerd i ended up uh you know opening her up and checking and doing the necropsy on her to see what ended up happening and it turns out that one of the ovum that was in her went bad and i think she died you know of septic shock so that was heartbreaking along with you know all uh 60 babies she had inside wow. so wow that was definitely a major heartbreaker because back to your point john one of the things people forget is that these guys will break your heart you could do everything right you could be you know have your process completely set up and everything you know looking really really good and something will end up just going wrong because at the end of the day they are animals right yeah and not everything goes according to plan yeah i think it's true you never know what's going to happen yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say we've all probably had that experience. I, I know I have. Um, like, for instance, for mine, it was uh, she ovulated. They were together recording. All went good. Everything was going perfect. She ovulated. Beautiful ovulation. And then three weeks later, just found her dead. And they, it was a bummer. I was like, man, that was a couple years ago. But it was a, a snowmaker litter. So oh, that man. was kind of heartbreaking it was a vps and all stuff but yeah it sucked yeah man these things will break your heart man that that's absolutely true but that yeah. being said there's a lot of times where patience does pay off right so oh, yes so serge uh maybe tell us uh, tell us about some, sometimes patience has paid off and maybe a project that you you've really looked forward to for a long time um you know and then how that en- ended up actually you know playing out successfully when you were able to be patient the um it- I got lucky on the first time I paired them, but I, I did wait on the male instead of going at 18 months. I, I just decided I'd rather wait, give them the extra year, and um, they did pretty good. It was a hypo jungle molly double head T snow female, and um, to a T key west uh, head anery, and beautiful litter. It gave me nice odds and everything. I didn't hit the snow stuff, surprisingly enough. When I first had them, I did see the babies, and I'm like, holy crap, I got five snows. They're just so light. As soon as, like, uh, two, three days later, I started seeing them, started seeing a hint of color come through, and um, now I just <laughs> realized they're, they're good VPI combos, but really nice. I, that was one of my my nice litters that I think uh, would be the ones up there that paid off. How about you, John? Probably the best one I can think of with the whole patient thing was back when I bought my uh, triple heads and double heads for VPI snows off of uh, Tracy Barker. You know, I raised, <clears throat> what's funny is I bought, I got a triple head or a double head female, a triple head male, and a head VPI female off of Tracy. And a year and a half later, you know, and everything's ready to breed, my fe- my male my male died. Oh, so man. I contact, yeah, I contacted Tracy. You know, and granted, we're, we're in the middle of summertime, so breeding season wasn't even coming up. And I told her, I said, I don't care what you have. I just need something to breed to these females. So she ended up getting me another triple head male. So, and now we're talking, I'm, I'm already four years, five years into this project with nothing. Two more years go by. So I'm, I'm, I'm right at seven or eight years into this project. And by now, the, you know, the VPI snows and, and snow glows have already been produced. Um, I, I breed that my double head or tri- my triple head male to my double head female, and I'm looking at her. I'm watching all the signs, and I'm like, "This chick's not even grabbing. She's nothing even going on here." And I had a buddy of mine over my house one day, and I was ultrasounding other snakes, and he looks at her cage, and he goes, "Isn't she due to give birth tomorrow?" And I go, "Man, look at her size, man. She ain't gonna drop birth. She's got nothing in her." And he goes, "Let's ultrasound her just just for you know just for purposes." I'm like, "All right." So I put the ultrasound machine on her, and I see all these skeletons. I'm like, oh, that's oh hilarious. Goodness. I'm like, this girl's going to drop. So I set my cameras up in my room, focusing on this cage. Oh, no <clears> way. I go, to bed, 
<laughs> I go to bed. I go to bed that night. The next morning, I wake up to go to work, and I roll over and grab my phone, and I look at the camera, and the whole cage is fogged up. And I'm like, no <laughs> way. I run downstairs. I run back upstairs, and my wife looks at me. She's like, what's wrong? And I'm going, I just hit on the VPI snow. <laughs> and the VPI snow glue to boot. So, oh, so yeah, that, that was an eight- or nine-year project, and I was just tickled to death to finally have it. Dude, that's fantastic, right. dude. And you know what? As, as crazy as it seems, like, you know, a lot of times, especially boa breeders tend to beat themselves up a lot, right? Especially about, you know, what their snakes, when they sna- their snakes go and they don't go. But, man, when those moments happen, bro, it makes it all worth it. It makes all that heartache, all the headache, all worth it. You know what I mean? When people ask you why you do it, that's why we do it. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing like boa goo in the morning, dude. <laughs> oh, my you know, gosh, it's beautiful. Have you caught, um, or how, I should say, how many litters have you caught uh, be born? Oh, me personally? I probably caught, like, actually in the process of actually giving birth, maybe maybe half a dozen, seven or eight total. Nice. I mean, well, like, I had, I had one born uh, 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 just, just, two, just yesterday. That I was li- literally looking in the cage, you know, and I'm like, eh, she looks like she's going to drop here soon because she, re- <laughs> she messed up her cage. So I'm like, okay, she's getting ready to nest. And then I come back two hours later and there was babies. And I know we'll, we'll discuss that later here shortly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. So I missed it. You know what? Um, funny thing with me, I've been, so I've been breeding for 25 years, right? Um, I have only ever seen one litter be born. <laughs> <laughs> They they always like I know my dates I always check my dates but it's like they wait till I'm out of the room on purpose yeah. I think they like secretly hate me but anyway yeah same same here I feel you I think the two years ago I missed uh I missed her within a two hour window and that was a VPI snow litter and I'm like oh come on seriously two hours she was done and then two years ago a VPI jungle litter um. I caught the tail end of it as I was going to work. She was pushing the last one out, oh, which man. didn't even really count because it was covered in the bedding, so I couldn't see it. And last year, finally, the VPI blood litter, I actually caught about nine babies be born. I, I was able to take video and stuff, but man, it, it was so great to see it versus I got to see all these videos everyone posts. But to see it yourself, that was something else. Yeah, man. Yeah, with me, it's it. Like I said, I've only ever caught that one litter. But you know what actually happened last year, which hadn't happened prior to prior to that ever, is that uh, I actually had a female uh, become gravid without me knowing it. So mm. um, I actually ended up putting a uh, uh, Key West uh, VPI male right to a uh, Sunglow Jungle uh, Het Anery uh, female right. And, I'm sorry, she was also uh, had black eye Henry. And um, small female, you know, it was her first year breeding. She just kind of hit that four-year mark, kind of made like my minimum size criteria, right? She was probably right around, you know, eight, nine pounds. And I never saw a lock. I never saw them court. So my assumption was nothing ever happened. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I stuck that male in there a couple times. I saw him kind of mounting her once, but there was definitely... You know, the tails were never twisted. Nothing, nothing ever happened. And then uh, one day I, I get home from work and my kids are screaming at me. They're like, Dad, I was trying to give the snake waters. There's worms everywhere. <laughs> so we crack open that thing and there's a bunch of babies all over her cage. And I'm like, what the hell happened? And yeah, man, that was uh, that was pretty awesome. I love I love those surprise litters. I mean, I, I sure should wish I would have known she was grabbing, but she was so, you know, she kind of like the story John was telling. I never saw her you know never saw an ovulation she never looked very big and mind you it wasn't a large litter she only dropped around 12 babies for me but still you know like it, it was definitely like a pleasant surprise yep those are always the best ones yeah man so now now guys i want to start talking a, a little bit about the the sterling gene um so john i know that you are, are currently working with the sterling gene kind of give us a little bit of background on that sterling gene and, and kind of why it caught your attention Oh, well, I mean, as we know, Ken, Ken Baumgart, Garter, Garter, Garden, I butcher his name every time. You know, he's the one that produced the Sterling first years ago. And for those who don't know, obviously the Sterling is a totally patternless snake. Um, 
you know, caught my eye years ago with the stuff he was doing, and it's obviously it's something different. And my, my goal with that, obviously, is to add the Henry gene to it. But uh, what's a funny story, and uh, four years ago, we were at the October Tinley auction, and uh, Ken put a pair of double heads for, um, he had a hypo and a motley double head albino sterling in the auction. Oh, and cool. uh, <clears throat> so I'm sitting there, and all the Boa guys you know, are sitting at two different tables. <clears throat> We're all sitting there talking, having a good time. Well, Brian Potter puts his pair of snakes up, and every Boa guy at both those tables jump up, arms waving. And um, Kevin Blumenthal was sitting next to me, him and my wife, and I looked over at Kevin jokingly, and I went, those snakes are going home with me. And he's like, yeah, right, whatever. So, you know, we're all bidding on these snakes. We're having a good time. And then all of a sudden the boat, the, uh, the bidding slows down because once you're hitting two and three, three thousand dollars you're knocking right. people out of it. Right. Well, then I, I cannot remember who had the high bid at the time. And Brian Potter's like, going once, twice. And then my buddy Derek raises his hand. And I'm like, if Derek's bidding, I'm out. So Derek, Derek bids them on up. Next thing you know, Derek wins this pair of snakes for a, you know, a good price at the time. I think I think the uh, price in the pair, uh, Ken had him for like five grand for the pair back then. So my buddy Derek wins these. He pays for them. He sits them down the table and slides them over right in front of me. And he goes, "Take them home and you take care of them." And I looked over at Ken and went, "I told you they're going home with me." Get the <laughs> hell out of here! Oh man. So, so I've had that pair of snakes in my collection for the past four years, raising them up, and uh, I just you know bred them this year and. Ken actually produced, I mean, by the pictures he's posting, I don't, I mean, I'm not knocking him. I hope it, I hope he's right. Uh, he produced the first albino motley sterling, which is, you know, basically a patternless yellow snake. And he's saying the, uh, you can tell the sterling by the, uh, uh, the motley sterling by the darker eye. The motley gives him a darker eye. Huh. Well, he beat me by four days. So my litter just dropped yesterday. That's the litter that I was uh, I was looking in on, and two hours later she dropped them. Uh, I hit on what I I believe to be the Sunglow Motley Sterling. Get out of here. On, mm. yeah, I hit on the I, I, I got two of them. Uh, one is more orange than the other, so I think that one's the Sunglow. But um, I think I, I might not be able to completely tell until if, if it's the Motley until after they shed. And uh, I've already been talking to Ken. So we're going to obviously compare our notes to check the eyes and compare everything to see what we got here. So, but yeah, it was a small litter. I mean, the female was good size. She ended up giving me uh, nine live babies. Okay. I got nine live, two DOA, and 12 or 13 slugs. So, I mean, you know, she, she, she should have had 22-something babies. Right. But uh, I, I got nine that I'm very happy with, and two of them are either albino or sunglow sterlings, possible motleys. That's insane, dude. And I, and I know you sent me some of those pictures, and I, I you know, I, I was shocked at what I was seeing. That was pretty freaking awesome. Oh, they're incredible. They're incredible. Yeah, man. So let me ask you, and what then, what other things would you like to see done with this gene? And maybe what's what's some of the plans that you have for the gene itself? Well, I'm breeding. I, I, produce, I purchased a hypo sterling uh, last year, and I currently had him breeding to a super ghost uh Super Ghost Jungle this year, and uh, I mean you should see the pictures. And this female's easy eight or nine foot. I mean she's ne she's been bred but never produced. Uh, and this male was little. He looked like really, like an inchworm on her. She, she was so big. But uh, so I'm trying to I'm obviously going to try and produce some hypo hypos and hypo ghost double head Henry Sterlings. I obviously want to see it more silver than a no than a normal Sterling already is. That's insane, I man. I want it black. Oh man, and do you think anybody's actually uh, plugged in anything into Sterling like IMG, for example, and seeing what that does? Um, I thought Ken was working on that, but I could be wrong. But uh, I mean, the Sterling itself is a very powerful gene, obviously. You know, I mean, because everything you, you know, you're breeding to it is totally patternless. But I, on, I, I, I should say, I believe or I hope that there's something out there that is going to break that pattern up. Um, like I said obviously when, when Ken bred the uh, the motley to it, you know he was hoping to somehow some way that would change the pattern, right. which it, it didn't. But I mean, if you think about it, and I, I mean I don't want to keep going back to ball python stuff, but the champagne gene and the ball pythons is oh, a very absolutely. powerful gene. And no matter what you're breeding to it, you're just getting a patternless uh, champagne colored snake. And then but, they threw at it. 
They threw Inchi at it. They yep. threw uh, Black Pastel. And they Black threw Pastel, Leopard yep. at it. And the Leopard gives it a oddball, whacked out pattern. I'm like, so, I mean, is it, what's it going to take now? Is it going to take uh, Aztec or something like that to break the pattern up? I mean, we don't know until we try it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, that's the thing. I think if we end up throwing Aztec, Inca, like any of those, you know, Roswell, Ladder Tail, like any, anything like that that ends up generating a pattern, we really don't know which one's going to be the key that kind of unlocks that project. Hands up creating like, it. And you brought up the IMG. I mean, can you imagine what IMG would do to that? I mean, yeah, it's insane, I mean, man. Like, like I don't, I, I, I couldn't even imagine. I mean, like worst case scenario, you make pretty much the blackest snake ever seen. You know, right? <laughs> Which that's not necessarily a bad thing, right there. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, man. Yeah, and John, John hit it on the nail. His comment saying, um, "You never know till we try it." A lot, like some people will ask, "Well, why do you do it?" Like they see it as pointless patternless snake this and that but you never know um the options are there depending what you breed to it you could get these great things and when you think outside the box that's when you can make those and yeah it's good to have that mentality if you're able to and you have the the capability to do it i'd say go for it it'd be great yeah no absolutely and i think that that might be one of the reasons why this could this animal could potentially end up you know becoming one poised becoming one of the next great genes in the hobby right because i think it i think the fact is that very little has been done with it right and i think there's so much left to plug into that particular gene because right now really what has everybody plugged into it color morphs right hypos right albinos things of that nature but really what we're missing here is we're missing the ability to plug in those heavily patterned genes and seeing which one's going to end up being the big unlocker just like they did to the champagne gene I mean, hell, it, it could be something as simple as Aztec. I'm not Aztec, but uh, Arabesque. You never know. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't know. Okay. That's absolutely true, man. You you simply don't know. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break, and then uh, when we come back, we are going to do the Dirty Dozen. All right? Sounds, Sounds good. good. The Dirty Dozen. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the Dirty Dozen. So, John, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you 12 questions, and uh, you give me your 12 answers. They can be as short or as long as you want them to be, okay? Sounds good. All right, brother. Number one, what's the size of your current collection? Currently right now, um, I don't have an exact number, but I'm somewhere between three and 400 animals. And uh, obviously that's going to increase since baby season is upon us. Okay, awesome, man. Uh, number two, husbandry. Um, are you a frozen and thought or live guy? And what's kind of your betting choice in your collection? Uh, well, when it comes to the food, um, I raise my own rodents. Uh, so that helps me out a lot. Um, but still, I feed all my boas either pre-killed or frozen thawed. Uh, I even start, I, I try and start all the babies off on frozen thawed as well. Um, that's another reason why I enjoy having the, uh, the live. I mean, I obviously breed a lot more rats than I do mice. But uh, the fact that you know most most of my babies normally take frozen thaw without a problem, but uh, if the ones that don't, you can give them a live meal once or twice and they jump right over to it. So I mean, obviously frozen thaw, I gear more towards that. Um, as for bedding choice, I mean it depends on the size of the animal. All my babies are housed on paper towels. Uh, all my juvenile stuff that are in my 70-30 racks are held, are raised on uh, aspen bedding. And I prefer the actual aspen shavings over the shredded aspen. Right. I think it's e easier for cleaning. I don't think it molds as easy. Um, and it, it doesn't compact down. As, again, that's just my personal opinion. Um, and for all my adult females, they are all on indented craft paper. Um, it's just easier for me because with the females, some of them are obviously bigger than others. And when I'm using the aspen, I've tried using the aspen there. They tend to push it all to one side of the cage. So if I use the indented craft paper, I just keep them on that up until uh, baby season. And then once the female is gravid, and I know she's got about a month left to go, then I'll add the shavings in there so she'll give something to uh, make a nest with. Yeah, no, I'm with you over there, dude. And isn't it a pain in the ass with these females? They always end up pushing stuff to one side of the, uh, of the, of the cage, and then they obviously will take a shit in the side that has nothing there. <laughs> Well, it's, it's like the, the, my, my female that just gave me that uh, that litter yesterday. I mean, I had this nice cage. The indented craft paper is down there. It's folded up in the corners. I've got the uh, aspen all over there. And for the last three days, she's made a nest. 
I come down there yesterday morning and she's totally under the paper. I'm like, you just had a bed and you just flipped it upside down. Yeah. Every time, bro. Every time over here with my stuff, man. All right. Number three. Uh, what's your favorite morph or locality? Uh, morph. And I, I mean, I sure, I sure pushed this enough, this interview, but uh, the Anne Regine. By far the Anne Regine. Um, I love it. I think everybody should have it in their collection. Um, for, for morph, that's probably my favorite color, obviously. Um, uh, pattern, the Motley Jean. Um, I mean, obviously the blacker you can make them, the better. Uh, as for locality, you know, I've only owned a few locality bows in my, my days, but uh, the one that I probably like the most right now is probably the Peruvians. And the only reason I can say I like that one more is because I've seen it in the wild. Yeah, yeah, dude, that, that goes a long way, man. All right, number four. What is the most overrated morph in your opinion? Oh, this is probably one of the most difficult for me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I mean, with, with all the genes out there, there's, like I said, there's still so much untapped ability. You know, even like we discussed before with the Sterling gene, you, hopefully there's something else out there that'll unlock it. But uh, for most overrated, and without touching or maybe your least that, favorite. Your least favorite uh, is another way to put it. Well, I mean, I don't even have a least favorite. For you. But, well, I mean, I don't have a least favorite, but I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say the Super Fire. Only because once you have a white snake, there's nothing else to do to it. Right. I mean, the, the, now the fire gene itself, you know, I mean, it, it's a, what it does to a Hypo, what it does to Motley, changing the pattern, changing the color, that to me, and there's just still so much more to do with that. And, I mean, I own a Super Fire. You know, I'm still trying to get into breed this year. I've had him almost four years now, and he hasn't done anything for me. But, you know, but I'm trying to produce other fire stuff. But, and and I, I love the Super Fire, but once you have it, it's, there's nothing else to add to it. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. All right, brother. Number five, what's the most underrated morph? I'm going back to the Anry. I, 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 can't, I can't push the Anry enough. <laughs> yeah, man. And let me ask you as far as the anery, is there a particular line of anery that you prefer um, that that you're focusing on? The only the, the only line of anery I deal with right now is just, I mean, I got nothing but type, type one. Okay. Um, I do have a pair of snakes that I purchased off a buddy of mine that I believe he got off Big Mike. Yeah. And I believe they are a possible hit for RDR Black Eyed anery. Yep. But... I mean, I'm not trying to, I, as of right now, I'm not trying to prove that out. Yeah, no, I'm with you, man. But actually, you know what? That's where I get, where I got all my Anery stuff from is actually from Big Mike. And that's also where I got my Silver Bullet stuff from. So oh, he, nice. produ he produces some really great stuff, man. He's actually one of my favorite breeders, I think, in the hobby right now. Number six, what is your favorite part of the hobby? Educating people. Uh, obviously, the whole snake thing out there is some misconception about it. Where, you know, I mean, when you, I mean, people who post stuff on Facebook, I mean, like if I post a picture of a snake on there, you're going to look at it. You're going to go, that's awesome. I like it. Give me the thumbs up. And, but yet people who are not snake people are like, oh, it's a snake. You know, put a shovel in it, kill it. You know, I think obviously, and uh, I've been saying a lot here lately, replace fear of curiosity. You yeah. Know, and do you think that's changing? I, I feel like that that's actually changed a lot over the last 20 years. I think it's getting better, yes. I mean, obviously, the, the Internet's out there, so people, you know, are obviously learning more about it. So I mean, the more you know, the better, you know, the better you, better educated you are, the better off, better off you are. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. All right, man. Number seven, what's the worst part of the hobby for you? Low ballers. Oh, dude, yes. <laughs> I mean, Preach. I mean, I mean <laughs> The, I mean, my thing about that is, I mean, because you, you yourself, I mean, myself, you, we've all gone out there and we've, we've found what we want. And, you know, I mean, if you've got a snake online and you know, even if we're best friends or not, I'm going to go, hey, what's my price? And if you want $1,000 for it, you tell me $1,000, I'm going to pay the $1,000. Yeah. If you say, hey, because we're buddies, I'm going to give it to you at 800 give it to me at 800 But, I mean, to give you a perfect example, and this literally just happened four or five days ago. I had a guy email me about a snake I have online, and I have it online for $900. And he goes, he emails me, and he goes, will you take 125 for it? Get the hell out of here, bro. Oh, my God. 
I'll forward you the email. And I, here's what's funny is I told him, I said, for $125, that's fine, but it's going to cost you $775 for shipping. <laughs> that's funny, man. So, I mean, yeah, dude. I mean, I mean you, you put too much time and effort, your work, you know, your hard-earned uh, money, and time is money. I mean, you know, you, you spent the money, and you've taken the three to five years, eight years in some projects to produce the animal for that, and then somebody wants to give you 25% of what it's worth, come on. It's insane, dude. It's absolutely insane. And mind you, so I get it. Obviously, people are looking to get a good deal. Obviously, people might sometimes have limited funds, man. But there's no quicker way to discredit yourself than to completely lowball somebody on their hard work and their investment in, into that animal, right? Um, yeah, man. Honestly, dude, I think that, that would be my biggest pet peeve in the world just in general, dude. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm all about giving somebody dude. a deal. It's insulting, man. It, it, it is. I mean, I'm all about giving somebody a deal, but I mean, I'm not going to give you a super 25% deal on your very first purchase from me. Once you become a, a regular customer, you know, hey, I'm going to cut you some slack later on down the road. But I mean, the very first one, no, come on, help a brother out here. Yeah, I'm with you, man. And, and like, honestly, I, like I've gotten to the point... So my wife actually gives me a hard time on this stuff, right? Because in one sense, like for, for guys that are like my good friends in the hobby, right? If they want a snake, dude, honestly, most of the time I'll almost give it away to the guys. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like in, in my in my, in my my eyes, I, I prefer going to somebody and be like, yeah, you know what? Don't worry about, about the money. Just send me something cool in the future. You know what I mean? I've done that many times. But if I have a new person that I don't know and they come up to me and they try to lowball me on an animal that's maybe taking me 10 years to produce, you know, they can kiss my ass at that point. Like that's yeah, the agreed. quickest way for me to just completely block them and not want to deal with them. The worst is when they actually come in as a legitimate buyer initially, right? Asking the right set of questions asking for pictures and then now you're spending time trying to get some good pictures of the animal maybe getting some videos things of that nature only for them to then lowball you and then when you counter that lowball you know you never hear from them again that irks me to like no amount of measure. yeah it's also pretty bad like if they inquire about it and they ask uh like what's your rock bottom price which is fine you give them a price and then they come back with an offer way below that it's like well why even ask for a rock bottom you should have just offered in the first place told you no and go from there but it's like they just ignore anything you say yeah dude. when somebody when somebody asks me what's the lowest you'll take I, i'll reply back to them what's the most you'll pay yeah there you go that's actually a really good answer man i actually haven't thought about that probably because i get so pissed when i see their reply <laughs> at that point i just delete the damn email oh yeah right. yeah because then at that point you can just break away and say i'm we're too far apart and there's no point of going going past that see you guys are really nice i just tell them to go fuck themselves at that point <laughs> I, I, I lose my temper pretty quick when it comes to that point when we get to that point all right man number I, eight I, 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 I lose my temper, but I do it in front of the wife. I mean, I'll, I'll bitch, I'll, I will bitch and complain about a customer in front of my wife, but I don't do it to the customer, and I probably should sometimes. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's like, uh, have you ever seen that uh, the Facebook thing with the texting where, like, somebody texts you, uh, you know, what's the lowest bottom price, and then you end up, like, replying, doing the angry reply, then you erase it, then you oh put my the, God, yes. kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Multiple times, yes. Oh, man. That is, that is totally the world we live in. Yeah, it is. All right, brother. Number eight. Uh, what's another species that you keep, and uh, why do you keep those other species? Uh, currently, besides the boas, I have uh, rainbow boas. I've got Brazilians and Colombians. Um, I also keep ball pythons. Um, both, both of those are on a small scale because the boas are my main thing I enjoy the most. And I also have uh, Gila monsters. Yeah, man. So how did you get into the Gila monster thing? Uh, I mean, the heel, I mean, uh, I've never been a real big lizard guy, but the Gila, for some for some reason, years ago, always fascinated me, and I bought my first pair four or five years ago, maybe longer than that, probably six or seven years ago, and it's one of those things I had them, you know, I was keeping them, and it, it, it's, it's one of those things I always wanted, and then once I had it, about four months into it, I'm like, yeah, they're okay, 
But then I started breeding them, and I'm like, okay, now it's still more interesting. So that's the only <clears throat> only lizard species I keep. I've had other lizard species in the past, but that's, you know, the Gila's now the only lizards I have. Nice, man. Uh, what kind of captives do these guys make? Are they pretty mellow? Uh, like, do they have, like, a personality to them, or are they just, like, you know, lizard rocks? No, they, I think they have a good personality to them. I mean, obviously, if, if – in even though they are a venomous lizard, I, you, you can still handle them. Obviously, you want to be careful what you're doing, um, but they can be. They can be. Uh, I don't. I don't even want to use the term tame down. But they can be where they're handleable. But obviously, you know, to an extent, uh, it's not something you'll stick your fingers mouth for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but I mean, I mean, all mine are pretty much mellowed out. I mean, I don't handle them a lot, obviously. You know, because I mean, I, I I honestly feel better with the with even even my boa constrictors. I mean, I don't handle a lot of stuff unless I'm cleaning, feeding, or doing whatever. I just think that the less interaction you have with them, sometimes it makes them better breeders. Right. Where you're not bothering them as much, so they're more they're more of a uh, display thing for me. But like I said, I do breed them. And you said you were also uh, messing with Brazilian rainbow bows, right? Yes, I've got <clears throat> uh, I've got Brazilians and the Colombians. Um, I'm also working on uh, the different morphs with those. The Colombians, oh, cool. I've got, yeah, I got the Colombians. I got the leucistics and the T negative albinos. Um, Brazilians, I am working on the hypos, the anries, the stripes, and the T positive albinos. Hey, question for you in in regards to the lucies. Um, do they still keep that level of iridescence once they turn lucy, or is that something that goes away? Uh, once once they're white, they don't have the iridescence like a uh, a regular Colombian. I mean, that's and that's the thing about the Colombians. I mean, the Colombian, the Brazilians are beautiful. They're beautiful snakes, but man, they're nippy as hell. Yeah, they are. Uh, and that's the only downside to them. But now, what's funny about the Colombians is, I, I mean, when the Colombians are first born, I mean, my one of my first litters I had last year, I caught the female right after she got done uh, dropping the babies, and as I'm pulling the babies out of the cage, they're still in the egg sac, biting me through the egg sac. Get out I'm of like, here. Oh, oh man, I, I wish I would have had video. I posted a video of me pulling some babies out of a tub and putting them into, a, uh, obviously, the spare, the new tub they're going in. And they're just, they're, as I put another one in there, all the babies in there are just striking up at me, trying to grab me. And my, my wife's laughing I'm like like crazy in the background. It's funny. Um, I was sending that one to you as well. That's but once the, Colombians start, you know, once the Colombians start eating, they lose that initiative to bite as much as the mm -hmm. Brazilians do. I don't, I don't know what it is. Hmm. Do you think they, they uh, tame down overall better in the long term, or is or do you see them both uh, species kind of tame down? I I think the Colombians do big time. All my adult Colombians, I could not tell you the last time I've been bit by them. Now the Brazilians, they they bite nonstop. Um, most of my adult Brazilians are ones I obviously purchased from other people, but all the ones that I have raised up myself from babies, they all tend to have pretty decent attitudes. They're not uh, oh, cool. nowhere near as nippy as some of my adults. Cool. All right, man. Uh, number nine. What's a common misconception about you? Oh, misconception. Ah, uh, I want to say, you know, probably that I can be mean or intimidating, and a lot of that's probably for the fact that I'm, I'm bald headed. I got a beard. I got uh, uh, sleeves and tattoos, and uh, I'm one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Now the whole mean and intimidating thing, that was great when my daughters were young. Oh, the boyfriends coming around. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean I mean, I am one of those guys I can talk to anybody about anything, anytime. So I mean there's not a mean bone in my body. Yeah, man. I'm the opposite, man. I, I don't look intimidating at all. I'm like this little short Hispanic guy that everybody's like, Oh, he seems like a really nice guy. Nobody pings me for being, you know, like the ex MMA fighter and ex special operations dude. Which I find pretty hilarious. <laughs> so, unfortunately, when my daughter when my daughter you know brought bo a boyfriend home here and there, I wasn't very scary to them until they actually, you know, saw what I actually did for a living at the time. Oh man! <laughs> All right, number ten. Uh, what makes you say? What was I thinking when you look back at your time in the hobby? Oh, what was I thinking? You know, I mean, of all the decisions I've made and all the things I've done in this hobby i don't i don't regret anything i've done i mean i wish i could have gotten further earlier you know obviously my, my kids held me uh, I, was, I shouldn't say my kids held me back but i spent <laughs> more time with my kids you know i spent everything on them and uh but uh i don't i don't regret anything i've done nothing at all that's awesome man 
All right. Uh, number 11. What's one tip you would give the people looking to invest in boas and reptiles in general? Buy quality. Buy quality and buy from somebody that was going to be there for you in the long run. But, I mean, it doesn't have to be a uh, big breeder. It can be somebody new who's <clears throat> who's trying to be a big breeder. Just somebody who's going to be there in the long run for you. And, you know, obviously don't buy cheap. Find what you're looking for and find the best quality version of that. That's awesome, man. All right, number 12, finally. You got any shout-outs you want to send out to people listening? Ah, uh, shout-outs. My main shout-out would probably be to my wife for putting up with me for all this in these years. Um, you know, she lets me do what I want to do, lets me get what I want to get. Um you know, she's there for me. So, like on weekends, if I'm gone doing shows or traveling, you know, I know I know my animals are being taken care of. She's down there feeding and watering the rats, checking on everything. Um, as for you know, uh, other boa discussion, I mean, because obviously everybody I live around are all ball python breeders. But yeah. uh, I I talk to uh, Tony Antonucci and uh, Jeff Ronnie a lot, and uh, my one of my uh, business partners, Derek Burnett. You know, I mean he. Is there to help me and you know, help me figure out the best financial situation for stuff sometimes because a lot of times I think with my eyes and not not the pocketbook. <laughs> Amen. Amen on that, man. Well, guys, I think that wraps it up for today. So, John, uh, let the people out there know uh, where they can learn more about your animals. Ah, uh, I mean, I do everything on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I got my I got my personal page is John Chalmer, then my business page John Chalmer Reptiles. Uh, my Instagram handle is just J Um I do have a website, uh, johnchalsmerreptiles.com, but it's not up to date, even though you can contact me through it. Plus, I have uh, everything that's available, which is not a lot right now, but babies are coming on uh, Morph Market. Awesome. And then, Sergio, let the people out there know where they can find you. Yeah, on uh, Instagram and Morph Market, it's uh, Sergio Hernandez Reptiles. And on Facebook, just Sergio Hernandez and uh pretty easy to find awesome well guys that wraps it up for today thanks for listening we are out guys that was a great episode thanks to john chosmer of john chosmer reptiles for joining us today join us next time as we speak with dr brad bernardini of breakneck boa company we're going to talk about his work integrating the blood gene into the sharp mvpi genes we're also going to talk about his work as an orthopedic doctor, and he's going to give us some tips on maintaining a competitive collection while working a high-level profession. Thanks for listening, guys. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Do us a favor. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and YouTube. Until next time, grow them slow. <laughs>